Hi guys, it's November 17th and we're here for our Bible and Year Challenge reading. That is going to come from Ezekiel 39 through 41, Psalm 131, and Luke 12. So Ezekiel chapter 39. The slaughter of Gog's armies. Son of man, prophecy against Gog. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. I am your enemy. O Gog, ruler of the nations of Meshech and Tubal, I will turn you and drive you toward the mountains of Israel, bringing you from the distant north. I will knock your weapons from your hands and leave you helpless. You and all your vast hordes will die on the mountains. I will give you as food to the vultures and wild animals. You will fall on the open fields, for I have spoken, says the Sovereign Lord. And I will rain down fire on Magog and on all your allies who live safely on the coasts. Then they will know that I am the Lord." Thus I will make known my holy name among my people of Israel. I will not let it be desecrated any more. And the nations, too, will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. That day of judgment will come, says the Sovereign Lord. Everything will happen just as I have declared it. Then the people in the towns of Israel will go out and pick up your small and large shields, bows and arrows, javelins and spears, and they will use them for fuel. There will be enough to last them seven years." They will need nothing else for their fires. They won't need to cut down wood from the fields or forests, for their weapons will for these weapons will give them all they need. They will take plunder from those who plan to plunder them, says the sovereign lord. Now I'll make a vast graveyard for Gog and his hordes in the Valley of Travelers, east of the Dead Sea. The path of those who travel there will be blocked by this burial ground, and they will change the name of the place to the Valley of Gog's hordes. It will take seven months for the people of Israel to cleanse the land by burying the bodies. Everyone in Israel will help, for it will be a glorious victory for Israel when I demonstrate my glory on that day, says the Sovereign Lord. At the end of the seven months, special crews will be appointed to search the land for any skeletons and to bury them, so the land will be made clean again. Wherever some bones are found, a marker will be set up beside them, so the burial crews will see them and take them to be buried in the Valley of Gog's hordes. There will be a town there named Hamana, which means horde, and so the land will be finally cleansed. And now, son of man, call all the birds and wild animals, says the Sovereign Lord. Say to them, gather together for my great sacrificial feast. Come from far and near to the mountains of Israel, and there eat the flesh and drink the blood. Eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of princes, as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and young fat bulls of Bashan. Gorge yourselves with flesh until you are glutted. Are glutted. Drink blood until you are drunk. This is the sacrificial feast I prepared for you. Feast at my banquet table. Feast on, feast on horses, riders, and valiant warriors, says the Sovereign Lord. Thus I will demonstrate my glory among the nations. Everyone will see the punishment I have inflicted on them and the power I have demonstrated. And from that time on, the people of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God. The nations will then know why Israel was sent away to exile. It was punishment for sin, and they, for they acted in treachery against their God. Therefore I turned my back on them and let their enemies destroy them. I turned my face away and punished them in proportion to the vileness of their sins." Restoration for God's people. So now the Sovereign Lord says, I will end the captivity of my people. I will have mercy on Israel, for I am jealous for my holy reputation. They will accept responsibility for their past shame and treachery against me after they come home to live in peace and safety in their own land. And no one will bother them or make them afraid. When I bring them home from the lands of their enemies, my holiness will be displayed to the nations. Then my people will know that I am the Lord their God, responsible for sending them away to exile and responsible for bringing them home. I will leave none of my people behind. I will never again turn my back on them, for I will pour out my spirit upon them, says the Sovereign Lord. Chapter 40, the New Temple Area. On April 28th, during the 25th year of our captivity, 14 years after the fall of Jerusalem, the Lord took hold of me. In a vision of God... He took me to the land of Israel and, sent me, and set me down on a very high mountain. From there I could see what appeared to be a city across from me toward the south. As he brought me nearer, I saw a man whose face shone like bronze standing beside the gateway entrance. He was holding in his hand a measuring tape and a measuring rod. He said to me, Son of man, watch and listen. Pay close attention to everything I show you. You have been brought here so I can show you many things. Then you will return to the people of Israel and tell them everything you have seen. The East Gateway. I could see a wall completely surrounding the temple area. The man took a measuring rod that was ten and a half feet long and measured the wall, and the wall was ten and a half feet thick and ten and a half feet high. 
Then he went over to the gateway that goes through the eastern wall. He climbed the steps and measured the threshold of the gateway. It was ten and a half feet deep. There were guard, there were guard alcoves on each side built into the path into the gateway passage. Each of these alcoves was ten and a half feet square, with a distance between them of three eight. With a distance between them of eight and three fourths feet along the passage wall. The gateway's inner threshold, which led to the foyer at the inner end of the gateway passage, was ten and a half feet deep. He also measured the foyer of the gateway and found it to be fourteen feet deep, with supporting columns three and a half feet thick. This foyer was at the inner end of the gateway structure, facing toward the temple. There were three guard alcoves on each side of the gateway passage. Each had the same measurements, and the dividing walls separated, separating them were also identical. The man measured the gateway entrance, which was 17 and a half feet wide at the opening, and 22 and 3 fourths feet wide in the gateway passage. In front of each of the guard alcoves was a 21-inch curb. The alcoves themselves were 10 and a half feet square. Then he measured the entire width of the gateway, measuring the distance between the back walls of facing guard alcoves. This distance was 43 and 3 fourths feet. He measured the dividing walls all along the inside of the gateway up to the gateway's foyer. This distance was 105 feet. The full length of the gateway passage was 87 and a half feet from one end to the other. There were, re there were recessed windows that narrowed inward through the walls of the guard alcoves and their dividing walls. There were also windows in the foyer structure. The surfaces of, of the dividing walls were decorated with carved palm trees. The outer courtyard. Then the man brought me through the gateway into the outer courtyard of the temple. A stove pavement ran along the walls of the courtyard and 30 rooms were built against the walls, opening onto the pavement. This pavement flanked the gates and extended out from the walls into the courtyard the same distance as the gateway entrance. This was the lower pavement. Then the man measured across the temple's outer courtyard between the outer and inner gates. The distance was 175 feet. The north gateway. There was a gateway on the north, just like the one on the east, and the man measured it. Here, too, there were three guard alcoves on each side, with dividing walls and a foyer. All the measurements matched those of the east gateway. The gateway passage was 87 and a half feet long and 43 and 3 fourths feet wide between the back walls of facing guard alcoves. The windows, the foyer, and the palm tree decorations were identical to those in the east gateway. There were seven steps leading up to the gateway entrance, and the foyer was at the inner end of the gateway passage. Here on the north side, just as on the east, there was another gateway leading to the temple's inner courtyard, directly opposite this outer gateway. The distance between the two gateways was 175 feet. The south gateway. Then the man took me around to the south gateway and measured its various parts, and he found they were exactly the same as in the others. It had windows along the walls as the others did. And there was a foyer where the gateway passage opened to the outer courtyard. And like the others, the gateway passage was 87 and a half feet long and 43 and 3 fourths feet wide between the back walls of facing guard alcoves. This gateway also had a stairway of seven steps leading up to it, and there were palm tree decorations along the dividing walls. And here again, directly opposite the outer gateway, was another gateway that led into the inner courtyard. The distance between the two gateways was 175 feet. Gateways to the inner courtyard. Then the man took me to the south gateway leading into the inner courtyard. He measured it and found that it had the same measurements as the other gateways. Its guard alcoves, dividing walls, and foyer were the same size as those in the others. It also had windows along its walls and in the foyer structure. And like the others, the gateway passage was 87 and a half feet long and 43 and 3 fourths feet wide. The foyers of the gateways leading into the inner courtyard were 8 and 3 fourths feet deep and 43 and 3 fourths feet wide. The foyer of the south gateway faced into the outer courtyard. It had palm tree decorations on its columns, and there were eight steps leading to its entrance. Then he took me to the east gateway, leading to the inner courtyard. He measured it and found that it had the same measurements as the other gateways. Its guard alcoves, dividing walls, and foyer were the same size as those of the others, and there were windows along the walls and in the foyer structure. The gateway passage measured 87 and a half feet long and 43 and 3 fourths feet wide. Its foyer faced into the outer courtyard. It had palm tree decorations on its columns, and there were eight steps leading to its entrance. Then he took me around to the north gateway, leading to the inner courtyard. He measured it and found that it had the same measurements as the other gateways. The guard alcoves, dividing walls, and foyer of this gateway had the same measurements as in the others, and the same window arrangements. The gateway passage measured 87 and a half feet long and 43 and 3 fourths feet wide. Its foyer faced into the outer courtyard, and it had palm tree decorations on the columns. There were eight steps leading to its entrance. Rooms for preparing sacrifices. 
A door led from the foyer of the inner gateway on the north side into a room, into a side room where the meat for sacrifices was washed before being taken to the altar. On each side of this foyer were two tables where the sacrificial animals were slaughtered for the burnt offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. Outside the foyer on each side of the stairs going up to the north entrance, there were two more tables. So there were eight tables in all, four inside and four outside, where the sacrifices were cut up and prepared. There were also four tables of hewn stone for preparation of the burnt offerings, each 31 and a half inches square and 21 inches high. On these tables were placed the butchering knives and other implements and the sacrificial animals. There were hooks, each three inches long, fastened to the foyer walls and set, up, set on the tables where the sacrificial meat was to be laid. Rooms for the priests. Inside the inner courtyard, there were two one-room buildings for the singers, one beside the north gateway facing south and the other beside the south gateway facing north. And the man said to me, The building beside the north inner gate is for the priests who supervise the temple maintenance. The building beside the south inner gate is for the priests in charge of the altar, the descendants of Zadok, for they alone of all the Levites may approach the Lord to minister to him. The inner courtyard and temple. Then the man measured the inner courtyard and found it to be 175 feet square. The altar stood there in the courtyard in front of the temple. Then he brought me to the foyer of the temple. He measured its supporting columns and found them to be 8 and 3 fourths feet square. The entrance was 24 and a half feet wide with walls, one in, or, with walls 5 and 1 fourth feet thick. The depth of the foyer was 35 feet and the width was 19 and 1 fourth feet. There were 10 steps leading up to it with a column on each side. In chapter 41, after that, the man brought me into the holy place, the large main room of the temple, and he measured the columns that framed its doorway. They were 10 and a half feet square. The entrance was 17 and a half feet wide and the walls on each side were eight and three fourths feet wide. The holy place itself was 70 feet long and 35 feet wide. Then he went to the inner room at the end of the holy place. He measured the columns at the entrance and found them to be three and a half feet thick. The entrance was ten and a half feet wide, and the walls on each side of the entrance extended twelve and one fourth feet to the corners of the inner room. The inner room was thirty five feet square. This, he told me, is the most holy place. Then he measured the wall of the temple and found that it was ten and a half feet thick. There was a row of rooms along the outside wall. Each room was seven feet wide. These rooms were built in three levels, one above the other, with 30 rooms on each level. The supports for these rooms rested on, rested on ledges in the temple wall. Rested on ledges in the temple wall. But the supports did not extend into the wall. Each level was wider than the one below it, corresponding to the narrowing of the temple wall as it rose higher. A stairway led up from the bottom level through the middle level to the top level. I noticed that the temple was built on a terrace which provided a foundation for the side rooms. This terrace was ten and a half feet high. The outer wall of the temple side rooms was eight and three fourths feet thick. This left an open area between these side rooms and the rows of rooms along the outer wall of the inner courtyard. This open area measured thirty five feet in width and it went all the way around the temple. Two doors opened from the side rooms into the terrace yard, which was eight and three fourths feet wide. One door faced north and the other south. A large building stood on the west, facing the temple courtyard. It was 122 and a half feet wide and 157 and a half feet long, and its walls were eight and three fourths feet thick. Then the man measured the temple and he found it to be 175 feet long. The courtyard around the building, including its walls, was an ad additional 175 feet in length. The inner courtyard to the east of the temple was also 175 feet wide. The building to the west, including its two walls, was also 175 feet wide. The holy place, the most holy place, and the foyer of the temple were all paneled with wood, as were the frames of the recessed windows. The inner walls of the temple were paneled with wood above and below the windows. The space above the door leading into the most holy place was also paneled. All the walls were decorated with carvings of trubum, each with two faces, and there was a palm tree carving between each of the trubum. One face, that of a man, looked toward the palm tree on, on one side. The other face, that of a young lion, looked toward the palm tree on the other side. The figures were carved all along the inside of the temple, from the floor to the top of the walls, including the outer wall of the holy place. There were square columns at the entrance to the holy place, and the ones at the entrance of the most holy place were similar. There was an altar made of wood, three and a half feet square and five and one fourth feet high. Its corners, basin walls, its corners, basin sides were all made of wood. This, the man told me, is the table that stands in the Lord's presence. Both the holy place and the most holy place had double doorways, lead each with two swinging doors. The doors leading into the holy place were decorated with carved trubum and palm trees, just as, the, just as on the walls. And there was a wooden canopy over the front of the temple's foyer. On both sides of the foyer, 
There were recessed windows decorated with carved palm trees. Okay. Psalm 131. A song for the ascent to Jerusalem, a psalm of David. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or awesome for me. But I have stilled and quieted myself, just as a small child is quiet with its mother. Yes, like a small child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, now and always. And Luke 12. A warning against hypocrisy. Meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling about and crushing each other. Jesus first turned to his disciples and warned them, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware of their hypocrisy. The time is coming when everything will be revealed. All that is secret will be made public. Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill you. They can only kill the body. They cannot do any more to you. But I'll tell you whom, who to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill people and then throw them into hell. What is the price of five sparrows? A couple of pennies? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to him than a whole flock of sparrows. And I assure you of this. If anyone acknowledges me publicly here on earth... I, the Son of Man, will openly acknowledge that person in the presence of God's angels. But if anyone denies me here on earth, I will deny that person before God's angels. Yet those who speak against the Son of Man may be forgiven, but anyone who speaks blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. And when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about what to say in your defense, for the Holy Spirit will teach you what needs to be said even as you are standing there. Story of the Rich Fool then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, don't be greedy for what you don't have. Real life is not measured by how much we own. And he gave an illustration. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. In fact, his barns were full to overflowing. So he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store everything. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you, ha you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get it all? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Teaching about money and possessions. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, So I tell you, don't worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or whether you have enough food to eat or clothes to wear, for life consists of far more than food and clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't need to plant or harvest or put food in barns because God feeds them, and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Of course not. And if worry can't do little things like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he, be, won't he more surely care for you? You have so little faith and don't worry about food, what to eat and drink. Don't worry whether God will provide it for you. These things d dominate the thoughts of most people. But your father already knows your needs. He will give you all, all you need from day to day if you make the kingdom of God your primary concern. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give it to those in need. This will store up treasures for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven have no holes in them. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart and thoughts will also be. Be ready for the Lord's coming. Be dressed for service and well prepared, as though you are waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in in the moment he arrives and knocks. There will, be, there will be special favor for those who are ready and waiting for his return. I tell you, he himself will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, there will be a special favor for his servants who are ready. Know this, a homeowner who knew exactly when a burglar was coming would not permit the house to be broken into. You must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. 
Peter asked, Lord, is this illustration just for us or for everyone? And the Lord replied, I'm talking to any faithful, sensible servant to whom the master gives the responsibility of managing his household and feeding his family. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I assure you, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But if the servant thinks, my master won't be back for a while and begins oppressing the other servants, partying and getting drunk, well, the master will return unannounced and unexpected. He will tear the servant apart and banish him with the unfaithful. The servant will be severely punished, for though he knew his duty, he refused to do it. The people who are not aware that they are doing wrong will be punished only lightly. Much is required from those to whom much is given, and much more is required from those who, who to whom much more is given. Okay. Much is required from those to whom much is given, and much more is required from those to whom much more is given. Jesus causes division. I have come to bring fire to the earth, and I wish that my task were already completed. There is a terrible baptism ahead of me, and I am under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I have come to bring strife and division. From now on, families will be split apart, three in favor of me and two against, or the other way around. There will be a division between father and son, mother and daughter, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, When you see clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, Here comes a shower, and you are right. When the south winds blow, you say, Today will be a scorcher, and it is. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but you can't interpret these present times. Why can't you decide for yourselves what is right? If you are if you are on the way to court and you meet your accuser, try to settle the matter before it reaches the judge, or you will, or you may be sentenced and handed over to an officer and thrown in jail. And if that happens, you won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. That is all for today. We'll see you next time.